If the Emperor has no haters, I'm dead. Once again, not gonna do a usual uh, YouTube intro here for this. But this is the Grey Knights Part 1 Warhammer 40k lore slash history. Hopefully sound is still fine. I have not really messed with it since the last, since I did the Hell's Reach reaction. So hopefully uh, no problems. Um, recording this one live because um, I can. And because I felt like it. Uh, also because this one's like 52 minutes and I didn't feel like just standing and sitting in front of this camera for like over an hour for just one video talking to myself. I wanted someone, some witnesses here on my left hand side on the chat. Anyways, all that gabagoo said, yada yada yada. Go ahead and dive in. Hopefully it's not too loud. It might be a bit too loud here. Especially here at the beginning. Lewton likes to put a lot of music at the beginning. Oh, see. There's only war. Wah. One. Three lines. Ominous. I am the hammer. But what if you weren't? I don't know what that means. I am the tip of his spear. Kinky. Lewd, even, some might say. NC-17, perhaps. I like the music though. Totally gonna get copyright strike. No, not struck. Flamed. Probably gonna have to mute this on YouTube. Is the music over? Can I go back to normal volume? Not speaking Lubiton. Grace my ear holes with your voice. More words to read. Okay. One unbreakable shield against the oncoming dark the coming darkness. One final blade forged in defiance of fate. Let them be my legacy to the galaxy I conquered and my final gift to the Well reading in my final gift to the species i failed arcus demonica inscription attributed to the emperor of mankind the man that sits on a poopy throne yeah, i feel like this intro here for this video was too fucking long this was two and a half minutes Whispers are sometimes heard on Imperial worlds. I don't, I don't really I feel like that's an overly indulgent intro of just nothing. I don't know. Like, sure, it kind of sets a vibe, but also, like, it's not for me. Of an Astartes force, rarely spoken of or seen, but to those enemies of the Imperium who know their names, forever they are feared. If standard Imperial Astartes are on many worlds rarely seen, if ever, then the Order of the Grey Knights are comparatively invisible, barely a myth or a legend, likely spoken of as Silver Angels and no more than that. We've seen already some of the darkest entities that exist in the galaxy of the far future, and that humanity is able to wield such forces as the Imperial Astartes, who stand as the last fragmented Thank bastions you. of defence against the nightmarish terrors that seek to cleanse humanity from the galaxy. Few forces though have the pure and distilled ability as well as the tools required to face the ever more threatening horrors that the Imperium must. Nor do most Imperial forces carry the strength of mind or the willpower to do so. Those who face the worst nightmares of mankind are known simply as the Grey Knights. 
Their order, founded at the end of the heresy, to stand as a bulwark against the entities of chaos and the horrors who threaten humanity. Even fewer individuals will qualify to join their honoured ranks than those who seek enrolment to join these standard space marines. The Grey Knights are a highly secretive order, yet rightly feared by many as a force with unrivaled powers and unbreakable mental will. Unlike the regular space marines, if you could ever call them regular, those brought into the... <laughs> yeah, they're puny. Pathetic. Lame, even. The honoured ranks of the Grey Knights are implanted with a gene seed, directly imbued with the power of the genome from the Emperor himself. Grey Knights exist outside the standard chain of command comparative to- I do like what Lewisin does here, is he gives those, like, small recaps, uh, like in every single one of these videos, or at least in his, like, you know, the, the more uh, recent ones. I don't think he does it really in his older ones. Um, but like here in that example, right, he's reminding us, you know, like that, that kind of information there is not really necessary for like us, but like that is good. That is still good to put in for people that are, you know, coming in that don't know anything. Um, so I, I do like that he, uh, Lewitton does that, does those, you know, Hey, yeah. Reminder. Uh, or if you're new here, uh, certain people have the emperor's semen in their blood. Oh. They have, have the emperor's genome uh, or whatever. And he doesn't really expand on it, and he doesn't need to, right? There are other videos that he talks about that, right? Um, uh, so, yeah. I, I like that he uh, just makes that little... By the way, yeah, for new people or people that maybe forgot, Gene Seed to the Adeptus Astartes, who follow the subsequent commands of the Adeptus Administratum, the High Lords of Terra, and now the Lord Commander of the Imperium. The Grey Knights are in fact not aligned with the regular military Imperial forces, but are instead a part of the Imperial Inquisition, who unlike all other forces within the Imperium, answer only to the Emperor himself, and as such operate outside of the ordinary structure of the Imperium of Man. They are a component force of the Ordo Malleus. Smash which is a subset of the Inquisition. The Ordo Malleus is otherwise simply known in layman's terms as the Demon Hunters. There are other similar sub- <laughs> Divisions within the Inquisition, such as the Ordo Heretics, the Witch Hunters, and the Ordo Xenos, the fairly self-explanatory Alien Hunters. The Ordo Malleus Inquisitors and the Grey Knights' Not entire smash. focus is to destroy, purge, and cleanse any physically manifested demons or chaos entities who encroach on the physical materium, as well as to exterminate those individuals who show either a taint or desire <laughs> to spread the message of chaos and disrupt the peaceful order of the Imperium. The story of the Grey Knights and indeed the Inquisition is more detailed and intricate than you- Guys, I know who that is. I know who that is. Yes, yes, that's Gilliman may imagine, its origins lie at the very core of the consequences displayed for all to see that resulted because of the Horus heresy. The creation of the Order of the Grey Knights centres around two of the strongest and my own personally favoured figures in the Imperium, who are both not only instrumental in its survival, but who would also show absolute unwavering loyalty to the Emperor, Malkador the Sigilite and Nathaniel Garrow. The story of this all begins during the early days of the Horus Heresy. Imagine being known as Malkador the Sigilite, and then Nathaniel. Nate is right here. Just Nate. Where Horus Lupercal, as now the War Master of the Great Crusade, would make his first devastating strikes against humanity, and finally his true loyalties to be shown openly that he had turned away from the Emperor and the Imperium and sided with the Gods of Chaos in an attempt to destroy the Emperor and annihilate whatever remained of the shattered Imperium of Man. Already by this time, some of the Primarchs close to Horus were already aware of the War Master's switch in loyalty and were making their own tentative explorations within their ranks to discover who they could rely upon, who would support their cause when the time came. The ultimate goal, of course, being that the higher ranking Astartes brothers would be those who the regular ranks would look to to see who they were going to take a lead from, and who would have to resultingly crush any loyalist remnant brothers in the legions. Any Astartes officers who were known to be unbreakable or too straight minded would certainly have to be dealt with before or after the fact. This is when Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrett enters the scene. 
Now he was serving as a battle captain within the Death Guard Legion, a space marine force who along with their Primarch Mortarian would turn traitor to the Imperium and subsequently become the foul and Losers. plague marines of Nurgle. Garrow though would stay as one of the very few in the Death Guard to remain loyal to the Emperor. He would in fact be one of the most staunchly loyalist Astartes of this whole devastating period in Imperial history. But why? Well in the For days him. leading up to his pivotal role, it's also helpful to understand the background of who Nathaniel Garrow was. For he was recruited before his Primarch had even been discovered, and unlike many Space Marines later, as such he knew loyalty directly to the Emperor. Inception. Garrow was one of the earliest members of the 14th Legion, when it had still been known not as the Death Guard, but as the Dusk Raiders. At this time the Legion Dusk Raiders? Hold on, what was the other name? Death Legion? Garrow was one of the earliest members of the 14th Legion, when it had still been known not as the Death Guard, but as the Dusk Raiders. Hmm. Death Guard, Dusk Raiders. Which is cooler? I think I'm more per- I think- I think I prefer, uh, Dusk Raiders. No. I don't know, Death Guard just sounds so fucking edgy cringe. But also Dusk Raiders does too. Hmm. Which sounds more edgy cringe? I think Dusk Raiders is ultimately more edgy cringe. Death Guard is probably a little bit- a tad bit better. At this time the Upon Legion analysis. carried not the later well-known marble white and green trimmed armor, but instead had a dull grey and crimson shoulder plate. They were named for their tactics using devastating raids that would commence as soon as the light had faded, many who faced them would surrender rather than face the coming onslaught as the sun would set, and the 14th were one of the early legions recruited from Terra itself during the final days of the Unification Wars. These warriors were some of the strongest of their breed and served to cement the early Legionis Astartes and prevent any risk of fracturing toward the ultimate success of the Emperor's Unification War. More importantly though, and this remains to my mind critical to Garrow's role in the Inquisition and the Grey Knights, was that the Emperor did not subdue the Warlord clans from which Garrow came as part of his unrelenting war across Earth during this time. In fact, quite unusually, the Emperor actually sought a peaceful resolution instead of crushing them under the weight of his Thunder Warriors. Garrow came from a region known as Old Albia, previously European Albania, and at this time the region held some of the most powerful and well-experienced warriors on Earth, who even carried many battalions of proto-dreadnoughts. The warriors of Albia would not submit to the Emperor, and through many devastating battles they would remain defiant. Whilst knowing he could probably win through sheer attrition, the Emperor saw this as unnecessary for both sides, for while he sought the ultimate domination and unification of Terra, this still need not come at any cost. Instead he would call for a ceasefire and would approach the ruling council of Albia, it is said clad in no armour but cloth of white and crimson. The Albia clan at this time tired of ruling warlords and endless war would listen to the Emperor as he laid out his inclusive plans to unite and take humanity to the stars and more importantly a path beyond endless meaningless bloodshed. To the great surprise of his generals and counsellors, the Albia Council accepted the Emperor's plan and without any shots fired would become part of the Emperor's great vision. Even more importantly, the way he approached the situation would bring the powerful Albia warriors into the Emperor's ranks, not as being physically and mentally subdued through a war of attrition, but as those injected with passion and loyalty for the cause. This would make the Albia ranks some of the most zealous and loyal supporters to the Emperor, revering him above all others. More importantly, Albia would gift its most powerful sons to the Emperor, who would in turn become the first of a new breed, now known as the Space Marines. These early Space Marines would quickly gain reputations among their existing forebears as relentless, disciplined and experts in survival and endurance. They would systematically destroy any target assigned to them and throw waves of armoured super soldiers against their foes. As time passed their originally grey and plain armour would begin to show ranks and embellishments that had been part of Old Albia. Shoulder plates especially would be painted deep crimson, the colour of the blood of their enemies. 
While the ranks of the Dusk Raiders Edgy. were known for being unrelenting and highly destructive, breaking enemies' discipline, throwing them into panic, and leaving many veterans fleeing the field in terror as the waves of grey and crimson would smash against their defences, the early 14th Legion, following the Emperor's example, were also well known for respecting agreements and deals struck between themselves and opponents. Early surrenders, which became more and more common, would always be upheld by the Dusk Raiders, but as equally as they would hold to these agreements, those who would break or go outside the time of these terms would be shown an unrelenting and savage level of brutality against them. Oh! Lovely! The Dusk Raiders would continue in their sole loyalty- I always like those kind of lightning transitions, just like the rain and cuts to a different- I always like those scene transitions. Into the Emperor, for as long it's, as- It's totally a trope, and it's one that I welcome. 80 years until the time came for them to be reunified with their designated Primarch. This would be far from the joyous event that many had hoped for, but indeed a much bleaker shadow that fell upon the Dusk Raiders. They would be dissolved and broken down, recreated by Mortarion as the Death Guard. Their prior honours and loyalties scarcely remained. For one thing, up until this time, the Dusk Raiders had been nearly entirely Terran-born from Old Albia, yet after their recreation as the Death Guard, their forces under Mortarion's leadership would originate from his homeworld of Barbarus, and any could see the divisions and fractures of loyalty that this was potentially going to cause. And these divisions would finally break out into the open at the inception of the Heresy, whereby Mortarion would judge at least one third of his legion as loyalist to the Emperor, notably most of these being original Dusk Raiders. And here is when we would see some of the first horrific acts of treachery in the events of the Istvan III Massacre. The governor and forces of the Istvan system had risen in rebellion to the Imperium during the Crusade, and as such many loyalist marines were deployed to subdue and rein in these rebel forces. The War Master Horus would lead the campaign to secure the region, and legions participating would be the Sons of Horus, the Emperor's Children, the World Eaters, and of course the Death Guard. Mortarion would deploy a large contingent to the planet of Isfarn III, notably those he had deemed loyal to the Emperor. Horus would unleash a hellish bombardment of virus bombs to the planet, and any Astartes unable to find shelter would be exterminated, along with the civilians across the planet itself. This onslaught led to the estimations of as many as 8 billion deaths, and the remaining gases of the decaying and dissolved remains of organic matter across the planet were now filling the atmosphere. These would be ignited, causing a firestorm that Lovely. raged across the entire planet, melting and bringing down many hive cities that remained. An Angron of the World Eaters in a thoughtless rage would deploy to the surface to then slaughter the remaining loyalists in a battle that would last for months. Angron. Chill out, bro. That oh, seems a bit unnecessary. The planet's already burning to death. Whilst this was all going on, though, Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow of the aforementioned Dusk Raiders and subsequent Death God stood aboard his worn out assigned frigate, the Eisenstein. In the confusion of the Istvan III massacre, Garrow was one of the first to see the truth of the ensuing heresy and immediately took flight to escape any retaliation from the heavily armed traitors surrounding the planet. The ensuing flight to escape the traitors was not without significant difficulty, and all of the loyal Death Guard Astartes who remained aboard the Eisenstein under the command of Garrow swore to deliver the critical information of this betrayal to Terra, no matter the cost or the challenges thrown against them. After an extremely difficult journey, eventually Garrow was able to make contact with and finally bring the truth to the Loyalist Imperial Fists, delivering his message directly to the Primarch Rogal Dawn. Dawn, though, upon hearing this declaration from Garrow, reacted in a blinding rage and nearly executing Garrow on the spot for having voiced such unthinkable and unbelievable accusations to the hallowed champion of the Emperor, Horus Lupercal. Yet Dawn would be convinced, and upon finally realising the truth, knew his only course of action was to return to Terra and bring this critical matter to the Emperor himself. Garrow, though, as one of the most zealous and loyal believers of the Emperor, had sworn and believed to his core that it had been his quest and his responsibility to bring this to the Emperor, to voice it himself personally, and it was a crushing blow that he would not be allowed to do this. And instead, along with the remaining law- These people and their egos, dude, holy shit. Man, the Astartes have a fucking massive ego that they need to fucking take a chill pill. Like, goddamn. Don't, you're, you don't gotta be the main, you're not the main character, Astartes. Calm down. 
loyalists like, the were imprisoned on Luna, as they had now been subsequently deemed an unknown quantity. Now, this demonstrates the absolute fracturing of trust in the Imperial forces that has now begun in earnest, where before they could never have imagined such treachery to be possible, now no one could be trusted. For Rogel Dawn, Garrow and his retinue least of all, for having had direct contact with not only traitors and heretics, but also the unmentionable and unknown horrors of the warp during their journey. It would be left to the Emperor himself to determine if they were in fact loyal and trustworthy to the Imperium, or simply further pawns in the games of the Chaos Gods. Garrow though was still not past his harrowing trials of this time, and he'd now be faced with a battle never seen before, where one of his marines who had been injured by Nurgle's corruption whilst on board their flight through the warp on the Eisenstein, now would be possessed and reformed as a true abomination, a demon of Nurgle, or the Lord of the Flies. Garrow would be forced to fight this foul entity after it wrought devastation to the Lunar Fortress, and be like, this isn't so much a video on the Grey Knights, it's more so just a video on Garrow. Eventually defeated outside on the surface of Luna itself, banishing it back into the Immaterium. Now there is very much more to the story of Nathaniel Garrow at this time, but the key elements for us in this instance are that he was extremely zealous in his loyalty to the Emperor, and that he remained loyal to the Imperium, despite the majority of his Space Marine Legion being either slaughtered or turned traitor, and also that he was instrumental in preventing far worse devastation to the Imperium during the initial stages of the revelations that many of the Emperor's Astartes had indeed turned against him and were now already beginning to wage a devastating civil war. All of this is important because of where the story of the Grey Knights now turns. At this early juncture, the Horus Heresy was now openly underway. However, to put things in perspective, it's worth remembering that this civil war actually only lasted for a period of roughly nine years. And before we begin to look at the Grey Knights in earnest, we also need to understand the founding and formation. Nine years and what? How many? I think the YouTube comments told me how many books there are. Like over 60? Is that true? Is that accurate? There are over 60 Horus Heresy books. If there are that many, that's too many. That's too many. I don't need that many books for, for this event. At least in my opinion. <laughs> ...of the organization that they are part of. This is, of course, the Imperial Inquisition. And this is where we return to Nathaniel Garrow. Now, Garrow and others, including the Sister of Silence and Oblivion Knight, nice. Amandera Kendall, would be approached by Malkador the Sigilite, who you'll remember is the First Lord of Terror and the Emperor's Regent whilst away from Terror itself. Malkador was a psycho with extreme powers, possibly second only to the Emperor himself, and had been instrumental in protecting humanity. 64 books for the Horus Harris. Nah, y'all don't... That's ridiculous. There's no need for that many. There's no need for that many, like. Like, because there aren't that many, I, I don't. Like, there aren't that many characters. <laughs> like, sure, you can invent some and stuff, but like, for the ultimate, like, I guess, narrative purpose of the Horus Heresy. Uh. You don't need 64 books to accomplish what you're wanting to tell. That's too much. That's too, that's that's ridiculous. No. By taking position <laughs> upon the Golden Throne, whilst the Emperor battled the Warmaster Horus in the final hours of the Horus Heresy. Ultimately, Malkador would be destroyed by the sheer power of the throne and dissolved to dust. But he remains one of mankind's greatest heroes in the Imperium of Man. So at the early outbreak of the heresy, Malkador would approach these individuals and propose to them that he was considering creating a new organization within the Imperium, one requiring, above all else, individuals who carried a strongly inquisitive nature. Armandera would have her face and skin scarred to bear the sigil of the Regent of Terror using a composition of liquid metallic scarring. This would also be applied to Nathaniel Garrow's power armor, having all of his Death Guard markings removed entirely. His armor was now a pure grey silver and carried only the markings of the Sigilite. A mark which for thousands of years would carry terrifying weight and power throughout the Imperium and to its enemies. An infamous designation of a stylized letter I with three horizontal lines sitting centrally within it. This was the future marking of the Imperial Inquisition. 
It was prior to all the events of Nathaniel Garrow that the Emperor himself foresaw the need to order Malkador to locate individuals who had formed an organisation who those within would display unquestioned loyalty, a strength of mind and courage that was absolutely unbreakable. A tall order to be sure, and furthermore this organisation would answer to no one but the Emperor himself. Its sole objective would be to protect the purity of the Imperium and prevent its corruption by the witches, traitors, mutants and Xenos. Malkador's quest would lead him to search the galaxy for those who would become responsible for ensuring the safe future of humanity. The heresy had already demonstrated that the Astartes of the Emperor were far from incorruptible as the Emperor had once hoped them to be, and so the establishing of a body to oversee all and whose entry requirements were beyond extreme had become an absolute necessity. Garrow, having been marked now as one of the first, if not the very first members of the Inquisition would be tasked by Malkador with locating seven other Astartes whose loyalty was absolutely without question. Their legion being traitor or loyalist was irrelevant to Malkador, only their loyalty to the Emperor and to the Imperium in both a physical and a spiritual sense mattered. These individuals are the founding core of the Grey Knights. My name is Nathaniel Gar, and I am a legion of one. One of All the right, first Astartes Lord, that Garrow seek out was an ultramarine by the name of Tylos Rubio. A powerful psyker but under a decree by the Emperor, space marines have been outlawed from using psychic powers. This oath to the Emperor, especially among the ultramarines, was sacrosanct, and so when Garrow located Rubio fighting a fierce battle, he refused to leave his brother ultramarines, as any Astartes would do. But Garrow, believing Rubio to be one of the marines he knew suitable for his quest from Malkador, decided to remain and assist the ultramarines in fighting their battle. However, the intense engagement they were fighting against the traitorous word bearers quickly deteriorated, and Rubio, realising they had few options remaining, decided their only chance of survival was to unleash a devastatingly powerful psychic attack, in direct violation of the Emperor's decree. <coughs> Subsequently after the battle, despite having saved many of his brother Ultramarines, Rubio was now held in disgrace by them, and upon seeing their turned backs, he realised he had little choice other than to take an oath of moment to Garrow and dedicate himself totally to following the orders of Why the fuck is he being shunned for saving the day? That doesn't make fucking sense. The Sigilite. What? Like, the but Astartes are supposed- aren't they all psychers? I don't- what? Why, why is he being shunned? The next Stupid. marine to join the retinue would be a curious choice, an Astartes Captain Mesa Varan, previously of the World Eaters Legion, which had now turned traitor to the Imperium. Similarly to Garrow and many Astartes across the legions at this time, Varan had disconnected himself from his betraying brothers and swore vengeance upon them. Yet unlike the clear-headed strength of character seen in Tylos Rubio, Varan was like many others among the World Eaters, quick to anger and longing for blood. Using psychic energy was banned by the Emperor. Still a shitty excuse. Blood and combat. So initially seeming a strange and even unfitting choice for this new order. He saved the day. He's fighting for the Empire. Like, oh no, to win the battle we had to do something that's banned. This is Warhammer 40k, they commit war crimes every goddamn second. Oh no, doing something... ban me... Stupid. Yet through a situation of- Also, that's a stupid fucking ban in the first place. The fuck is the Emperor actively trying to lose? Shit, better watch out, I might get charged with heresy for saying that. Deception and corruption involving a flotilla of refugee ships and multiple supposed loyalist marines from legions including the Emperor's Children and White Scars, Varan would demonstrate through a series of fierce close quarter engagements that he not only held extreme loyalty to the Emperor, but that he could also control his internal rage and showed great restraint in abiding Garrow's wisdom. Later on Terra, while reporting back to Malkador, Tylos and Varan would enter upon Garrow, wearing their now plain grey armour, marked with the distinctive eye insignia of the Sigilite. Varan exclaimed that he wished to become part of this new brotherhood, and Garrow accepted, under the express conditions that Varan constrain his desire for fire and retribution. Yeah, like, everything that, at least, so we haven't gotten that much regarding the Horus Heresy, I guess, in comparison to what is out there. But everything that I've heard so far regarding the Horus Heresy and the videos that I have watched regard like about it, it kind of seems like the Emperor deserved it. Like the decisions that he makes are fucking stupid. Like 
like he is not doing anything really to actively foment royalty. The time for these things would be later, and their immediate and more critical mission was to remain in the shadows, to fulfill their mission for the Imperial Regent, and the days for vengeance and physical fury would come soon enough. Now, not all of the original founding members sought by Garrow and Malkador were known, but the final known Astartes recruited was none other than Garviel Loken. Now, Loken is actually a fairly established figure in this early breakout period of heresy, as he once was a member of the now infamous Mournival within the Legion of the Sons of Horus, formerly the... The Emperor gave him his... gave them, like, his godlike gene seed, but he couldn't do anything about a fucking disappearing hairline, or a seeding hairline. And you call him all powerful? <laughs> Why would I follow a man that claims to be all powerful but can't stop the receding hairline for beings that get to live for thousands and thousands of years? Lunar Wolves. The this was the closest advisory circle of officers who would counsel their Primarch and now Warmaster Horus. This group all held a strong bond beyond that of usual Astartes brothers as an extension of the informal warrior lodge that they had become familiar with after the conquest of Davin. Regardless of its origins though, the Mournival was tasked with advising Horus in many roles including tactics, diplomacy, even ethical choices. Horus was a master of diplomacy. Ethics? In Warhammer 40k? That doesn't exist. ...the compromise before his corruption by chaos, and the involvement of the Mournival was partly a charade and partly genuinely useful. It certainly enabled Horus to retain and legitimize his decisions by portraying the appearance of making balanced and even-handed you know, choices. Stinky in over actuality, he often used others as a smokescreen to merely give additional weight to decisions he had already made in advance in his own mind. But Garvio Loken, after the horrors of the Istvan massacre, finds himself there abandoned. The majority of traitor Primarchs are bald. See, bald people are evil. By his brothers. As with the other loyalists, he would be subjected to the harrowingly traumatic virus bombing of the planet, which would horrifically slaughter billions, Astartes and civilian alike. However, not all Astartes on the planet were biologically dissolved out of existence. Many survived in bunkers, and as fate would have it, one of those survivors was Garviel Loken. Now completely mentally broken by the severity of his brother's betrayal and simultaneously the appalling atrocities he had witnessed, compounded by now his isolation on Istvan III, Loken was now devoid of his own identity, his mind no doubt suffering That's some crazy. kind of automatic defense system that's known to occur when a person suffers an especially traumatic event. Sometimes a person's mind will essentially erase its own memories as a means of psychological self-defense. Loken, now believing himself to be a guardian of the underworld, given the sheer volume of horror and death all around him, titled himself Cerberus, believing he was now the only remaining loyalist marine in the galaxy, and the one thing he knew for certain was his duty and his loyalty to the Emperor. Oh yeah, mega edgelord here, but on the that good as side. death had rejected him, good side edgelord. He would do his duty and guard for all time the biologically annihilated ruins of Istvan III. But that was until Malkador the Sigilite's chosen warriors would arrive, of course. Nathaniel Garrow had returned with the singular task of attempting to locate Loken, who they believed to be alive somewhere still on the planet, and more importantly believed him to be a strong candidate for the Sigilite's quest, if he was still alive, that is. Garrow, Rubio, and Varan would discover, after combat with Cerberus and disturbed creatures who deceptively initially appeared human but were in fact Nurgle demon hosts, that the one they sought was in fact the deranged and psychotic Cerberus. After a final battle between Garrow and the self-titled Cerberus, Garrow would eventually be able to reach through the fog of trauma that clouded Loken's mind and reach the few remaining shreds of purity and honor that was the Astartes, previously known as Garviel Loken. But now, he was about as far from being a glorious superhuman Astartes, a pinnacle of human development. He was not far from being described as more like a wretched, mentally barren animal. But as with all encounters during this time, the sense of skepticism and suspicion was powerful. Was Loken truly what they were hoping he would be, or was he even perhaps something far worse, more sinister, a deceitful agent left by Horus to spring some shrewd trap upon those loyal to the Imperium? 
The retinue would return to the Somnus Citadel on Luna, where what would follow was the first of many interrogations that could be perhaps quite appropriately classified as an inquisition. Loken would be pushed to the very knife edge of death multiple times as he's mentally and physically tested beyond the limits of even an Astartes. And even then there were those who did not believe his loyalty was not just a facade and that he harboured some latent evils to unleash at an appropriate time and place. The trials of Garvey or Loken cut to the core of the problem with the heresy and traitors to the Imperium. The issue being that even having sustained horrific interrogations and survived to see the other side, it could still not be said with any certainty that Loken was indeed truly loyal. It was different for the others like Garo and Rubio and Varen, who had through their actions displayed their loyalty. Yet even then to be pedantic, where do you draw that line in the sand? Horus himself had shown that any number of loyal and heroic acts didn't amount to any absolute sense of immovable loyalty to the Emperor. All yeah. of this was pushing towards the sense that in order to ascertain the best possible chance of purity and loyalty, you had to be extreme in the extreme. In the end it all comes down to a simple matter of instinctual trust, and for many members of the Imperium during the time, trust was a commodity that would be increasingly difficult to come by. With Loken being the last of the Astartes warriors Garrow had set to recruit, he had ultimately completed his quest for the Sigilite. Malkador would bring the twelve robed figures who now represented the finest and most stalwart members of the Imperium before the Emperor himself. Eight of these would be Astartes, and another four were human lords of the Imperium. Some of the Astartes came from the now traitor legions, and others from remaining loyalist legions. These facts would ultimately be irrelevant as the only key factor to their being in this place at this time was their total devout loyalty to the Emperor and the Imperium of Man. The Emperor was pleased, and Malkador could mark up another success for himself in service as the Emperor's regent. Having now been rehabilitated, Loken would embark on a quest set out for himself alongside another of Malkador's knights errant to ascertain the loyalty of the Dark Angels Legion and their Primarch Lionel Johnson. Alright, I'm going to do something that I rarely do. This video feels like it's just full of fluff. Like, I'm not vibing with this video. Like, this is... This rarely have I'm I'm just kind of sitting here taking this information. I don't feel like I'm not really getting anything. Like this just I'm like This is one of this is this is a weak video from Lewis in in my eyes. Like I'm not It's it just feels like a bunch of airy talk. Fluff. Nothing really substantial. Like, okay, we're getting information regarding these people, but we're still, like... Like... It's still not about the Grey Knights. Like, you, this 28 minutes could have been really summarized in just a few sentences like yeah during the Horus heresy uh we needed i don't know the utmost loyalty to the fucking emperor or whatever and so the gray knights were forged during the Horus heresy shit whatever we don't have to get so into these individuals man like it's i don't know it just slow it's slow and it's not all that interesting. The events that followed would be appropriately full of shadow and deception, but ultimately end in abject failure. And this entire episode compounded Loken's already badly damaged sense of self and further undermined his perspective and the core reason. Like, what does what does this have to do with the Grey Knights? Like, we haven't even established them yet. You're just we're just talking about people. Like, I came into this. This video is titled The Grey Knights. Let's talk about the Grey Knights, not talk about the people before they were really actually Grey Knights. Like, I I, I, I don't... Like, if you want to do a video on Lorcan, make a video about Lorcan. you want to do a video on Garrow, make a video about Garrow. Because this just comes across to me as just pointless fluff uh, in, in this video. Like, because it's not what I'm here for. I'm here for the Grey Knights. Listen for his existence. Loken had been forged by the Emperor as a pure weapon of war, but now he found himself playing the games of intelligence gathering and subterfuge at the behest of Malkador the Sigilite. 
discarded and severed from his brother marines that had stood forever with him. As his mental state continued to deteriorate, he found himself caring little for these other so-called knights errant working for the Sigilite. On the abject failure of his mission and his subsequent return, this would lead Loken to become increasingly isolated within an abandoned garden biodome on Luna. This created a surreal it, juxtaposition yeah, of one of the Emperor crazy. of Man's finest warriors, never having known anything in his life that could be described as peace, yet here he was in the most peaceful of surroundings. And also it feels like Lewitin in this video especially, there have been a couple Lewitin videos where it's felt like Lewitin is repeating a lot of inform uh, some information and thus kind of ultimately feels like he's doing it to pad runtime. That's come across to me. Um, this video in particular, it's, I feel like Lewitin is really repeating a lot of information he has already said. Um, for, for like, you know, if, Especially within the first 30 minutes here, the information that has been repeated, and it's kind of, it's it's not that like he's saying the exact lines over and over again, right? He's not doing that. But he is repeating essentially the same information, just wording it differently a lot so far in these 30 minutes. I am not vibing with Tending to an abandoned garden devoid of grounded, stable thought, lost amid the liquid flows of his delusions, barely knowing which were genuine and which were half-imagined ghost men. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't mind it when, um... Also, damn, my nose is starting to get stuffed. <clears throat> um, but I don't, I don't mind it when there are little bits of, like, quick reminders in these videos. Like, I talked about at the beginning, where Lewitin... In these videos, he reminds people like, yeah, uh, the Astartes are forged from the gene seeds of the Emperor. Whatever, that's fine. But literally in the last, like, what, five, ten minutes, how many times really have we been told this dude here, whatever, whoever the fuck we're talking about, is, like, losing his mind in, like, five different ways? It's... <sighs> memories spliced together with trauma and shattered emotions it's like it's one of the things um when you are when you learn how to edit yourself uh really when you also just in general learn how to edit uh stories and stuff like that uh and also one of the things that editors really will pr like when you get your book edited professionally something that seems to be that they focus especially hard on is whether or not you repeat yourself, but in different language. They make sure you are not repeating yourself. You're not saying the same thing, but just worded differently. They cut that shit out. It's like, you already said that, but you said it a little differently, so cut that out, right? That's how they cut out, uh, cut down uh, authors on their word length. Because authors do that a lot. It's something we do a lot. It's something I do. It's something I focus, I hyper fixate on. When I go through my edits, my self edits, where I'm like, okay, wait a minute, did I say something like that? And the only time it's important, the only time you keep it really, in my perspective, um, is if you are the different way you are saying it is providing it in a different context. If you are, if it is not providing different context at all, and it's literally just you saying the same thing just with different words, you got to cut it. And that's what I'm feeling really hardcore here in this video, is we're just getting the same information worded slightly differently. Uh... During one of these lucid periods, Loken would find himself again speaking with his dead battle brother, Tarek Torgadon. The internalized well, conversations about Loken would have with Torgadon, along with realizing name he is. had in his garden of rehabilitations, recreated the water garden where he and the Mournival first swore a sacred oath to serve the Emperor above all Primarchs and to ultimately uphold the Imperial truth, this was the mental keystone that Loken had needed for all this time. These fragments of memory filled that mental keystone position to secure the route open across a bridge that would allow Loken to access and unlock all of his involuntarily suppressed and previously locked memories. He could recall all of the prior horrors and misdeeds of Horus, the questionable decisions, the rash, the suspect, and the outright unnecessary. The Interax, Davin, and the Orishan technocracy incidents, and certainly not to mention the abhorrent atrocity that was the Isvan III massacre. 
Loken now feeling a renewed sense of purpose and loyalty while still also realising he was perhaps not what could be described as a stable individual, he would return to Terra to launch with the Sigilite and the Space Force Primarch Lehman Ross a certainly daring, if not also somewhat foolish plan to infiltrate Horus's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. After initially some success, things would quickly unravel. Still, Loken had in one final- Again, again, again. Why are we being, like, what is the point of all this information here regarding these people? What, what is the point? Because again, we are still not talking about the Grey Knights. Like, if, if, don't call it a Grey Knights video if we're not even fucking talking about the Grey Knights. Like, I just, eh. Final stand stood before his father Primarch Horus and shamelessly was invited to turn traitor. Like I understand this is leading up to the Grey Knights, but then um don't call it the Grey Knights. I don't know, like call it the origin of the Grey Knights or something like that. Um, I, I don't, I don't like this. Uh, to, to the Emperor and the Imperium, but Loken would remain defiant to the last, and his final fight with Horus- and I, I, again, I just don't get why we are spending so much time on these individuals. Like, yeah, sure, they've got stories and stuff, but like, again, for the purpose, at least my perspective as to what the purpose of this video is, and it's supposed to be lore history on the Grey Knights, that means it's a history on the Grey Knights, not a history on an individual. Right? Uh, teach me, like, how he has done before on different Astartes, where he kind of just talks about them broadly and maybe talks about their Primarch or whatever, their their leader. Um, but yeah, this is just... It's not at all, like... Like... My expectations here of what I was expecting this video to be based upon Lewitton's previous videos, the title, and the thumbnail of, of the Grey Knights here. This is not at all meeting the expectation of what I thought would be encompassed in it. And again, as I said just a couple minutes ago, so much of this information feels like the same thing being said in a different font would allow several of his boarding party of Malkador's knights to escape. Now, while the story 20, of Loken we still have 20 has little impact to go. on the creation of either the Inquisition or the Grey Knights, what it does illustrate is the complexity of mental avenues, pathways, and fragments that must be navigated by those working within some of the greyest areas of the Imperium. While the Grey Knights are known as such primarily because of their armor being devoid of the usual chapter colors and markings, you can also read beyond the simple aesthetic description and consider that the work being done by the most loyal of warriors and their inc Like these 30 minutes could have been really summarized simply as Grey Knights were founded during the Horus Heresy. Uh, and they were made up of the staunchest, most loyal people to the Emperor that proved themselves. And then you could then make separate videos regarding each individual. Inquisition no. counterparts is of a very grey nature. The story of Garviel Loken aptly illustrates this when you consider that after all was said and done, even Loken himself could not know if he was truly loyal to the Emperor until the situation was presented squarely to him by Horus standing there on the Warmaster's flagship. In these events were illustrated a crucible of loyalty. The Astartes, the Emperor's greatest creations, had been proven to be just as fallible. I'm curious how the internet is going to react to my a rant there about this video it's either gonna be well received or it's gonna get absolutely shit out. regular humans when it came to the dark forces of the warp Garvey but interaction is interaction baby negative or positive tide of corruption youtube doesn't care and to resist <laughs> YouTube's those fucking who stupid. hunger to endlessly feast upon the souls of mortals these new astartes would as loken demonstrated to the gods of chaos have immense and incorruptible willpower superhuman figures who would stand like unbreakable rocks where other men would be consumed by the tides and storms of the warp that would lash and overwhelm them those of this new breed of warrior would stand firm a force that could not be broken or kneel a soldier who finally talking about the gray knights in the, the gray knight video care not what was given back in return a symbol of the imperium that would choose obliteration and suffer the indignant despair of corruption
the minions of chaos now had truly something to fear for how can a four i will say though i do think i'm probably being a bit overly harsh in this video it is because um i did not sleep good oh i might be a little cranky for that i do apologize i recognize my behavior i'm acknowledging it but also i do my complaints are still valid very <laughs> like my complaints still stand around i just probably should do a better job defeat. of not being so harsh about them. The incorruptible. The abhorrent creations and traitors of the warp would now face a new breed of warrior, one whose time of stealth and subtlety was fast drawing to a close, and who instead would now exert the true wrath of the Emperor's spirit. Malkador and Nathaniel Garrow had forged them from the finest warriors in the Imperium of Man, and they would be the first of many. Then, that line there, information you have already said in, 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 with different words. Multiple times in this video. Multiple times. They would be the Grey Knights. 33 minutes and 48 seconds out of a 52 minute, 39 second video is when the Grey Knights are finally founded. In a video titled The Grey Knights. I don't, I don't fuck with that. I don't like that. Yeah, it's no. In the despair and darkness that was the Horus Heresy, the Grey Knights were a new hope. As would often be the case going forward, those Astartes that formed the founding of the Grey Knights nearly all possessed supernatural skills as psychers. Now while this had been outlawed by the Emperor, it was now realised as a necessary evil in order to combat the sheer pervasive and unstoppable forces of chaos. Under the Emperor's instructions, this new and- Again, why are you- Like, the Emperor's decisions don't make sense. He's like, yeah, I'm a ban- psychers but also i am a psyker and i'm going to actively be doing psych psyker things like people are gonna see that hypocrisy and they're gonna fucking that doesn't that doesn't create loyalty open hypocrisy of your own decisions does not create loyalty no wonder people betrayed you you fuck <laughs> highly secretive force would head to titan the largest orbiting moon of saturn malkador would accompany you say you do not want to be seen as a god Yet then you go and create superhumans. You sit on a golden throne calling yourself the Emperor of Man. Like, the hypocrisy is right fucking there. Which, of course, it is very human to be hypocritical. Right, I have said this before in, other, in another video. But still, the Emperor, not good. And it's creating loyalty. Like, don't be surprised people betrayed him. He deserved it. He's fucking stupid! <laughs> ...his new force and assist in the development of that ah. order, which would be heavily intertwined with what would be- If the Emperor has no haters, I'm dead. ...come the Ordo Malleus and the Inquisition. These Astartes carrying the already highly advanced genetic- I'm using that as the first thing people see when they click on the video. <laughs> I got my clip for the opening of this video when I edit it. ...adaptations of the space Clickbait. wings married with sort unbreakable of. mental really. strength strong psychic powers and some of the most advanced war gear available at the time the early grey knights were beyond what would be described as an elite fighting force they were the zenith of what every astartes aspired to be or had aspired to be before things had gone so catastrophically awry the story of the inquisition diverges at this point as the four human lords chosen by malkador would set out to lay the framework of what would later become the much feared inquisition Malkador, though, would lead the eight Astartes to the secretly created fortress monastery on Titan. And what they found was a heavily pre-prepared base of operations for a brand new order of space marines. Vaults of weapons and war gear, freshly lobotomized slave servitors, and most importantly, hundreds Ew. of thousands of fresh recruits waiting to undergo some of the most severe space marine trials ever devised to see if they would make the cut to become one of the few to claim the honor of becoming a space marine in a brand new and elite force of Astartes. This human stock material had already faced far-reaching tests to even reach this stage as Malkador's servants had searched millions of Imperial worlds for these raw recruits, crawling around inside their mind, scraping their synapses raw for any signs of chaotic corruption, a process that would leave some insane and others broken blackened shells, foaming at the mouth from having their minds scratched apart and ultimately collapsing into helpless vegetative states to likely then be processed as biomatter recycling. For those with Yum. the mental strength to endure and survive, 
they now found themselves ready to begin all over again and face trials that would test the resolve of even a hardened Astartes. Additionally, all of these new recruits already had psychic potential and if successful would then be able to forge and develop their abilities in a controlled way to lead them to the path of becoming a new breed of Astartes who wielded not only powerful war gear and the mental strength to resist the most powerful of corruptors, but also the ability to unleash psychic powers the likes of which had rarely been seen before in the ranks of the Imperium of Man. Still, while Malkador was instrumental in the initial establishment of the Grey Knight Order and had assisted the previous eight battle brothers in how they should organise and trial the initial elements of this new chapter, he was urgently recalled to terror. The Heresy War was becoming ever more severe and events around Terra itself were coming finally to a head. Malkador would carry out two further tasks in selecting the Grand Master for the Grey Knights from the Eight Astartes, to some surprise not choosing Nathaniel Garrow but a Marine known as Yanis. He would become the first Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights. Malkador would then use his even now astonishingly powerful psychic abilities as a human to throw up a reality bubble around Titan itself, sending it into the oh, war what? where it would await the inevitable conclusion to the Heresy War. Malkador would then return to Terra unknowingly for the last time. Who was Yanis though? Well, like many of the Knights Errant, he was plucked from the ranks of traitors, formerly Revio Levida, a sergeant of the Thousand Suns Space Marine Legion, who you'll recall had experimented with and developed psychic powers. These seemed the primary reason as to why Malkador would choose Yanis, knowing that these powers would be so critical. Yanis though was no ordinary Thousand Suns Marine. He had used his immense psychic power to lead the White Scars back to Terra during that heresy period, but was also critically suffering from an ailment that plagued all Thousand Suns, known as the Flesh Change. Oh. Huh? Oh, what? Now, early in the Crusades, whilst the Thousand Suns to their joy developed psychic powers, many would then begin to be struck down with a horrific and degenerative process of mutation. And they couldn't know this at the time, but this was the corruption of the warp infusing their bodies. This was known as the flesh change. Arvida, upon reaching Terra, was suffering greatly from this flesh change, and his body was mutating now beyond Ugh. control. Malkador was present at this time and pledged to try and heal Arvida. He would attempt to bind a shard of the Thousand Suns Primarch Magnus the Red to Arvida and attempt to create a shadow or nipples Ooh. Primarch in a psychic host who could sit then and guard the gate God, he looks on the so golden stupid. throne as the Emperor had intended Magnus to do originally. Instead though Malkador's plan would not work and the psychic fire of the Primarch shard would entirely consume Arvida and out of the fire would step an Astartes with no trace of the flesh change but neither a shadow Primarch or Revial Arvida. The Marine asked to be known as Yanus later Yanus. This Primarch infused Astartes born oh, out hideous. of the psychic firestorm would now become the Supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights Order. Even as the war raged on in material space, the Order of the Grey Knights would begin to develop their organization structure and their qualifying recruitment stages, which are unfortunately for those wishing to take part considerably more severe in their testing. While this can seem excessive, it is in fact ultimately necessary as the Grey Knights can accept nothing less than the most hardened and unbreakable individuals in both physical and mental respects. In these early days, the Council of the Eight Marines would begin to develop the training systems for those recruits awaiting trials to join the new order. But in later establishing periods, recruits are located by so-called chapter gatherers. These are usually somewhat retired veteran Grey Knights who perhaps due to extended service or a severely impeding injury are not best suited to carry out combat missions but their infallible judgment is still without question and this is arguably the most important weapon for a member of the Grey Knights. As with most Astartes, chapter recruitment can come from basically anywhere, but with the Grey Knights this can even mean another chapter's homeworld, as well as feral planets, penal worlds, even the much feared black ships, and as with the Inquisition, there are few if any barriers that constrain their decisions or their demands. Of those lucky enough to have been discovered after having likely already faced some sort of life or death pre-testing trial on their home planet, they'll be brought back to Titan itself and the Grey Knight's Fortress Monastery. For these individuals, this will either be a fairly unlikely spectacular new beginning or the far more likely beginning of the end, for they will either succeed or die. This and nothing else. Oh! 
as with what we might qualify as ordinary space marine trials if they can be called as much the recruits are put under immense physical and psychological testing and this can be any number of trials devised to push them up to and well beyond the limits of what an ordinary human should be able to withstand unlike ordinary astartes trials the grey knights often begin their trials for many recruits by instead of being taken straight to the fortress for the usual testing of physical trauma laceration pain induction and mentally scarring tests that will leave some a crying shivering gibbering wreck broken beyond help or leave others gritting their teeth through to the end refusing to submit or break the grey knights recruits face a far simpler challenge they're dropped down to the planet's surface to begin their testing and these recruits will face a simpler but much more harrowingly bleak test. The first test of simply even reaching the starting line alive. There are some exceptions of course, recruits who might show very special promise in their psychic abilities and any number of other factors can be taken just straight to the fortress proper, but this is the rare minority. Most new recruits will be instead dropped with little regard into the frozen wastes of Titan with no suitable clothing for the soul destroying task ahead. And while Titan itself had been terraformed years ago, the planet is still a barren, inhospitable wasteland. The recruits are simply left with no option than to face the absolutely unbearable conditions of Titan and march across the plains of the planet to reach the fortress monastery of the Grey Knights. Recruits at this stage will be simply designated a number to track their progress. All other information is irrelevant and should they fall they'll either be buried in an unmarked grave along with hundreds or even thousands of other failed potentials or perhaps simply just not buried or recovered at all. This is far more likely. This is the ah, disconnected and emotionless reality that litters the landscape of Titan as thousands of recruits continually trial for acceptance into this arguably most severe of Astartes assessment trials. As with most tests devised by the Knights, whilst this is a physical test, it's actually much more about the mental ability of the recruit. Can these recruits overcome their physical agony and the miserable reality of having to endure this marathon journey before their real tests even begin? Many will simply collapse and die en route, or those, depending on their background, may become completely mentally broken and just turn away from reaching the gates of the fortress monastery. And I've their been mentally will broken since I was 14. Death. But this is of concern to no one. Cowards and those who lack the discipline to follow through on their trials deserve nothing less. Those who manage to reach the gates of the monastery are given the briefest respite and also now fitted with a psychic inhibitor collar before being immediately sent back out to repeat the journey they just took. The inhibitor collar will now continually monitor the recruit's undeveloped psychic powers and should he at any time lose control of his psychic abilities, the collar will quite obviously explode. After completing this second trial, the recruit is then sent out again, this time perhaps with some slim supplies to walk far beyond through endlessly dangerous environments from crashed wrecks, roaming bands of insane and damaged servitors to eventually reach the Xanadu region on Titan. This caustic environment creates a haze and miasma of chemicals that will induce nightmarish visions and again test the recruit beyond the mental strength of any ordinary man. As if that wasn't bad enough, these visions are where the real test lies. The psychic inhibitor collar is for many the much more literal threat because now as the delusions and surreal lucid visions begin to consume the recruits created by the chemical clouds and caustic pools they find themselves in, for many this is simply too much to experience and control. For them reality unravels and simultaneously so does their control over their psychic abilities. The thousands of headless skeletons laying strewn around the chemical crystal pools of this area are a testament to this grotesque fact. For the minimal okay. amount of recruits who return from this marathon trial, they will be given a brief period to recover before facing, of course, more trials. Yeah, Unlike many space marine recruitment favorite. tests, the Grey Knight assessments go on and on and on. They're often much more about pushing a recruit to the limits of a mental breaking point than they are about the physical. Yet physical testing helps in breaking the mind and ensuring they are immune from physical stresses. The tests utilized by the Grey Knights are often designed to that end, often objectively pointless, physically excruciating, and always designed to push a recruit beyond the mental limits they have so far achieved to this point. For many, the largest test is simply not knowing at what point these unbearable trials will end. These tests will continue until the assessing- This looks like Ryan Reynolds at Deadpool. A little bit. And Grey Knight determines that a recruit has done enough to warrant initiation into the chapter so that now their true training can begin. Those who qualify will obviously be extreme in the few, 
which is entirely the point. Numbers spoken of are anything like one in a million individuals, and those who succeed will be rare examples of the very strongest cells and sinews humanity can produce. The harsh nature of the testing simply confirms this. Because of this extreme exclusivity, however, the Grey Knights are not as plentiful in numbers as, say, an Astarte Space Marine chapter. But what the Grey Knights lack for in weight of numbers, they'll make up for 100 times over with their weapon skill, physical and psychic powers, and above all else, a completely unbreakable will. Unsurprisingly then, after reaching this point is where the real trials begin. And as with the standard Astartes, advanced bioengineering and surgery are used to develop and condition aspirants what will be required of them in the months and years to come. The Grey Knights will also have silver hexagramic purity wards embedded under their skin and throughout their entire body. Yay, my favorite this is part. to enable them to be essentially untouchable by demonic entities. To be able to stand naked against the power and raging storms of the warp. You telling me I could strip down in front of Slanesh and nothing bad would happen to me? Gamers, I have an idea. Grey Knight aspirants will also need to pass the 666 rituals of detestation. These ritual trials are said to be nightmarish enough to mentally break even a veteran Astartes. But at this stage comes arguably the most severe test of a recruit. All recruits reaching this stage will then have their minds scrubbed and memories of their previous lives up to this point wiped. And the reason for this is to even more assuredly secure loyalty to the Emperor and simultaneously prevent potential horrors of the warp using a knight's own memories, fears, connections, desires against them. Additionally, they will have their names erased and they will be given new names past this point for the same reason, to disconnect them from their previous lives, family connections, because names can actually hold power over demons. And as such, Grey Knight names are carefully chosen to carry significant resonance within the warp. Their names will be arcanely crafted by the chapter scholars to work as a binary opposite to a specific known demon of the warp. As you begin to learn more about what it is to be a Grey Knight, you see that they're not simply hacking and slashing demon hunting warriors, battling the forces that seek to destroy the Imperium. To be a Grey Knight is to be purged of all that you are and were, and to become a literal living weapon of the Emperor. Understanding this gives more strength to their scripture and their sayings that are not designed simply to sound terrifying, but are a very real interpretation of what it means to be a member of the Order of the Grey Knights. This is why they will often refer to themselves as the Vengeance Weapon and the Blade of the Emperor. They see themselves as quite literal extensions of the Emperor himself, not individual glory-seeking warriors, simple, pure implements of his will. To demons in the warp, even hearing their opposing Grey Knight's name spoken aloud causes them intentional, terrible pain. For standard Space Marine aspirants, they'll start out as Scout Marines and they don't initially wear full suits of power armor. That honor comes later for them. But this is not the case for those in the Grey Knights. A successful Grey Knight aspirant for the chapter, because of the severity of the trials but also the nature of their battles, means that they are immediately issued a full power armor suit and pushed into full service as a Marine of the Grey Knight chapter. Elite is really not a term that can quantify the scale of achievement that is secured by becoming a Grey Knight Space Marine, becoming one of those one in a million individuals. But it would be fair to consider why anybody would put themselves in that position in the first place. And the answer to that is really very simple. Most applicants for the Grey Knights probably know very little of what awaits them. They will however be carefully selected by the veteran Grey Knights who visit their homeworld and for those who are chosen by what to those humans must appear to be demi-godlike figures they never dreamed they'd see with their own eyes, the idea of refusing selection would be unthinkable as fears of tarnishing themselves and their families with severe dishonor and shame would be rife. Unbeknownst to them of course their families would likely be mind wiped after the whole process anyway but those rare few who show the strength, courage, and above all indomitable human spirit to survive and proceed the to the next stages of testing spirit, will hold with them God, the most powerful weapon memories. any Grey Knight would choose to have. An absolute and unbreakable faith in the Emperor of Man and the Imperium. And that to begin with is surely enough. Get over.
We carry the light of the divine emperor of man into the dark places to purge the daemon, demonic wherever it may be found. Brother Captain Arvin Stin. Okay. That was the Grey Knights part one, Warhammer for the Kaylor Sasha Street. The video got good once we actually started fucking talking about the Grey Knights. Video was good in the last 20 minutes because we were finally talking about why we were here. <laughs> that first 30 minutes, I do not like it at all. It just felt like a waste of time. It was fluff. It was unnecessary for the goal of this video. Those those stories do have a place within here, but not in this video. At least not in the way that this video was presented to, uh, and the way Lewitton has presented previous videos regarding these fucking demigods. Um, the, the stories of these recruits, the first recruits to the Grey Knights, they should have been like their own separate video. They shouldn't have been in here. It just kind of, it just felt so unnecessary. It just felt like information being repeated to me, and it wasn't new information. It was stuff that could have been summarized so much shorter for the purpose of to still convey the same thing that was needing to be conveyed for this video and the information related to it. Um, so, this is like the first Lewiton video that I think I'm kind of i'd say i'm negative on i think this is the first one um because like yeah i just ugh, not like that first 30 minutes at all it was it just felt it just felt so unnecessary um for what was being said what was what was being conveyed <sighs> that was the video, and that was the live stream. You know, I'm just doing one. Um, thank y'all for hanging. Thank y'all for chatting. Thank y'all for commenting if you commented. Um, and so make remember to hit that like button. This is this is um Twitch people ignore this. This is for YouTube. <laughs> remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Well, actually, the subscription part applies to you Twitch viewers too. You can do that. You can give me money. Essentially, likely. By subscribing, even though I only receive 50% of your subscription, that is likely more than what YouTube will pay me for this video because YouTube has not been recommending my videos. Peace.